Could I please see a show of hands that you did receive your check register? Thank you. Okay, next we have public comment. Mr. Quick, bring us up to date on what's going on on Main Street. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, the council. Uh, this last month, of course, on the 16th, we had the rededication of City Hall. This is a very exciting event. I'd like to thank uh, Arlene Wilson from the Mayor's Office for bringing us in to help plan the ceremony. Uh, as well as Leanne from Leanne's Cake Creations for making a beautiful and delicious cake for the reception that followed. It was a great time. We had a good number of folks out there uh, to uh, show some support for a beautiful historic structure. That's always a great thing for Main Street. On the 22nd, we conducted our design audit of downtown. It was our first time yeah. to do that, but it will be an annual event. Um, again, I'd like to thank Arlene from the Mayor's Office and Lori Saunders from the Tourism Commission for being with us as we went through the design audit. We identified a number of areas for a potential improvement, uh, particularly to, uh, to repaint some of the curbs in downtown. The paint is uh, rather degraded. Some of that may have been because of the harsh winter that we had. But uh, for the indicators for where not to park or for the handicapped parking, it's not always clear anymore as it used to be or as visible when you'd be in a vehicle. Uh, also, a number of the uh, benches that are available in downtown are not actually bolted down. Um, and while they are heavy and difficult to move, if there was somebody with a mischievous mindset, that could be a, a bad thing. <laughs> so it'd probably be best if we could get the rest of them actually secured in uh, whatever place the city would feel appropriate for them to be. There are also a couple of spots we identified where perhaps we could add an additional bench or two, particularly as you're heading down, uh, heading down Maine, when you get to around finding for the museum, they start to sort of peter out. Uh, the same thing as you're heading closer to, uh, to Royal Spring Park. It's like there was an unidentified stopping point before you actually get to the end uh, of Main Street proper. Uh, perhaps that's something that we could look at for the future. Uh, also, when you get to the uh, bridge there by Royal Spring Park, uh, there's obviously some need of repair there. The, uh, the railings uh, have gaps in them, and those were intended to be safety railings. So it would be nice to have those spaces filled, perhaps to uh, repaint it in more of a, a safety or hazard color as opposed to the pink, which it is now. There are also at least two different points uh, on the bridge where the <coughs> curb is basically even with the street now. Uh, and we feel that, that would be a potential safety hazard if somebody was coming over that bridge, lost control of their car. However, momentarily, they would go right onto the sidewalk. There wouldn't be anything to slow them down at all. And uh, obviously, that could be a bad thing if there are pedestrians on the bridge at that time. Uh, I'll have some, uh, some more information, which I can provide to council later, because it just happened last week. So I did a, a preliminary review of all of the notes that we took and the maps that we annotated as part of the design audit. Uh, on the 26th, just this last Saturday, we had our garden day in the park down at Royal Spring Park. And uh, that was a, a great event that we had down there. They had a plant and seed exchange. We had the cooperative extension office and master gardeners out there doing exhibitions on how to do things like make a container garden. Um, or how to properly do composting. <coughs> and uh, it was a wonderful event. We had quite a few people out there. There's an article in the Herald Leader, which actually brought a number of folks up from Lexington. And uh, we were really happy to see that. Again, I'd like to thank the, some of the businesses that participated, uh, Leanne's Cake Creations again, and uh, Holy Smokers, which is ironic because they used to be in that building and now she is. Um, and also uh, Councilwoman Tingle Sames, who isn't here with us this evening. Uh, participated with Carriage House, uh, even though she was clearly under the weather at the time. So I really appreciate her fortitude in making it out anyway to be part of our event. And th this is part of our overall strategy to bring more attention to Royal Spring Park because it, it's a great historic and cultural resource that, that isn't used as much as it really should be. A lot of downtowns don't have <coughs> any sort of green space preserved. And that was Georgetown's original water source. The bridge that was built there was built in 1795. So we'd, we'd like to bring more attention to that, do some work on the cabins down there, and ideally in the future get some public restrooms. Uh, I'm guessing I'm out of time, so <laughs> let me just wrap up uh, by uh, thanking the, uh, the city clerk. She arranged for us to receive a surplus filing cabinet, which is a need I had uh, brought to council when we were discussing our budget. And uh, she identified one that was <coughs> in her office and arranged to have it uh, brought over and donated to us. So I'd really like to thank her for that. Thank you, David. Mayor, can I ask? Can I address you? Okay. you know what? I got a call this week from a North Broadway business owner as well as a customer of a North Broadway business owner. We, we apparently have a um, business that is stocking retail on the sidewalk 
um, down there. Can, can you check in and see if that violates any city ordinance or um, the, the call from the, from the business um, owner was that it may have been uh, impeding on pedestrian traffic or something like that? Right here behind us. Yes. Okay. Yes. Can you do that for me? Absolutely. Thank you so much. All right. Mr. Rice, bring us up to date on the museum. Another day. <laughs> well, just wanted to give you a quick update on some things going on at the museum. Uh, earlier this month, we had our uh, annual membership dinner. I was very happy to see Mayor Varney and, and Tracy was there. And I think we all had a good time. Had almost 100 people in attendance. Great outing. And a lot of good food. Mm -hmm. uh, didn't have had a single one say the food wasn't good. So, but um, we've also with that we've just uh, recently com um, sort of completed the main part of our membership drive. Uh, we try to get paid friends of the museum, um, and we've uh, worked myself and the board have worked very hard on that. <laughs> Last year, uh, there was for the whole year was a total of 101. Uh, so far, for just the four months of this year, we're already up to 152. So we're getting a lot more interest, a lot more people are participating in the museum, and, and that's our goal. That's what we want. A um, couple of other quick things. Uh, again, to uh, stimulate the interest and let everybody know that we're there, we're uh, uh, right now printing 5,000 brand new brochures to be able to put in different locations and hand out to make sure everybody knows about the museum. Uh, and in addition to that, Bill Stark is uh, uh, preparing a sign, an outside sign for us to again identify, you know, here's the museum. Uh, right now it's a little difficult. We've just got the wording way up at the top um, to really say that the museum is there. So I think an on street um, sign will do wonders to help everybody know that the, that the museum's there. And that's being prepared right now too. And then just finally, I might mention, in addition to the new fire alarm system that we recently got, uh, just last week we uh, completed a new burglar alarm system. Uh, we're getting a lot of valuable items in there, and um, uh, that's, you know, been a, a big concern. So, you know, now hopefully that's taken care of and a whole, uh, almost a completely brand new burglar alarm system. And I might mention, um, uh, I guess finally, uh, one of our uh, latest big exhibits that is attracting a lot of interest is uh, uh, we call it tools and tobacco. Uh, we have a lot of antique farming tools and especially as related to tobacco and tobacco products. And in fact, uh, in the back room, we're even growing our own tobacco. So wow. we don't know indoor tobacco. We don't as know long exactly. you're not down there smoking it. Uh, no, it's tobacco. I trust me, it's tobacco, but I'm, not, I'm talking about tobacco. I'm oh, <laughs> they, oh, I, I thought you were. Oh, you oh, thought I, I was talking about now, funny tobacco. Oh, <laughs> I think he meant it's illegal to smoke in yeah, yeah. public places. All right, we we won't go there. But, <laughs> but anyway, I invite you to come down sometime and see some of the exhibits. And uh, if you have an interest in those uh, the, the antique tools and and tobacco products, uh, be happy to see you down here. That's all. Thanks, David. Okay, next is the mayor's comments. First item we have is an executive order appointing Obi Wallen to the Assessment Appeals Board. This he'd be working in conjunction with the PBA. County Board of Assessment Appeals, effective May 1st, 2014. Obi Wallen is appointed as a member to the County Board of Assessment Appeals for a term that will expire on December 31st, 2016. Now this is, I think there's, this opening has been there since the beginning of the year. They only meet when they absolutely have to cause a property assessment. Motion for approval. Motion for approval. Second. Second. Any discussion on that? All in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you very much. Next I have a proclamation I want to read. <clears throat> Got some young folks here that we certainly want to recognize and honor tonight. Office of the Mayor, whereas Scott County High School boys bowling team led by Joni Jackson Cook making the Cardinals seventh region champs and whereas Coach Cook and her staff led the Cardinals to their third straight regional championship for the boys. 
whereas the Scott County Boys bowling team secured a second state title in three years. Therefore, let it be known that I, Everett Varney, Mayor of the City of Georgetown and the Georgetown City Council, do hereby recognize Scott County Cardinals bowling coach, Joni Jackson Cook, and the dedicated staff, and do congratulate the Scott County Boys bowling team on their state championship. Anyone wants to come up? Come up. We gotta have a picture. We put it in here. When you, oh, you're very welcome. Thank you for bringing the recognition to Scott County and Georgetown. <laughs> I was waiting for that. I'll get in a slot here. Mark, get over here. He was trying to see the camera. <laughs> run, Mark, run. Here, Dan, take one of Mark, will you? Hey, Thank come you on. for coming down here. There you go, Mark. There you go. We got you a picture. I'm going to put a card in there for you. Thank you so much and congratulations. Great Good job. job. Guys. Good job. All right. Well, we'll empty up the chamber now. Thank all of you for coming down and helping us honor them. Great job. Okay, next, on, next item on my agenda is approval of farmer's market to begin on May 23rd of this year. I don't have an ending date. I'll make a motion. Motion by Ms. Tackett. Second. Second by Mr. Thompson. Any discussion on, on this? This is an ongoing thing. It's been here for years, and I think our, our uh, citizens enjoy that. Absolutely. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Okay, next item we have is reschedule our Memorial Day Council meeting to some other date. Uh, I don't have my... I do. We talked about that today. Uh, we about we could have it uh, the next Monday. I, know, I don't know how you feel about... You're not here the next Monday. It was the Monday prior or the Tuesday after. Monday, pr Monday prior to Monday, the 19th, the 19th right, or the 27th or the 27th or the day. 27th those are your two choices or if if you want to come in on a Tuesday after Memorial Day that's also an option I know you none of you ever like to come in on Tuesday I don't that's know why May 27th right? yes yeah, May yeah. 27th I'm open or any other day what, what you guys Tuesday Tuesday Monday the Monday the 19th, just have two in a row. I just didn't keep it on Monday nights and keep the program going. Yeah, that's that's personal. May 19th. Okay. Okay. for me. Okay, that'd be Monday no the yeah, 19th. Midday. Finally, six years. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I see a show of hands of those who would like it on Monday the 19th. Look, unanimous. Okay, see? so Monday the 19th it is. Also, we are having Super Recycling Day out at Toyota that's being sponsored by the city and the county. It'd be on May the 16th 
from 11 to 6. And uh, this would be a great day to go out and take advantage of free dumping date. This is, they'll have signs and so forth that, uh, directing you to where you can take your uh, recyclables. So uh, that's on uh, May the 16th from 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. And uh, I know I was out last year watching them and a tremendous turnout during the time period that I was out there. So it, it's something our citizens need to take advantage of. Uh, another thing I'd like to announce, big announcement came out of Toyota today. You probably heard it if you're watching the news. Uh, it's a sad, sad day for Erlanger that uh, operation in Erlanger is going to be moved to many, many different locations. Uh, 1,600 employees, and I, I can't imagine the hit financially that we would take here in Georgetown if it happened to us. Uh, the good part about that is we're going to be receiving 300 engineers to be added to our workforce here in Georgetown. I got a call from, from Toyota today. I, I had a meeting. Uh, and I wasn't available for the uh, conference call that they had at 1 o'clock. And then they had, uh, I think, uh, released it to the news media at 2 o'clock. But they called me after I got home this evening to, to make sure that I knew about it. And I did not know about it at the time. But uh, as I said, it's a, a tr tremendous hit to Erlanger. But it uh, really is a, a boost for us. Uh, the the uh, relocation is Plano, Texas will be probably the major area where human resources and, and those type of jobs will be going. And uh, there'll be jobs going to New York, California. As I said, it'll be 1,600 are going to be dispersed. Uh, I guess you could say it, uh, the state itself will take a hit, but certainly the, the city of Erlanger. But it is certainly good for Georgetown. Uh, their losses are gain, and I really hate it for them, but uh, uh, we certainly welcome 300. That means uh, coming in with Lexus and this administrative <coughs> staff that we have coming in, it'll be 1,050 new employees at Toyota. So uh, it's, it's a great shot in the arm. I, I told the official I was speaking with, I said, I'm sure the Scott County Home Builders Association will thank you profusely. Uh, again, it's a, it's, a, it's a big boost for our economy, and uh, I know that in two and a half years we'll be able to get a, a real good gauge on uh, our investment in Toyota with the Lexus coming. We'll, we'll have a better uh, feel on, on how our finances are at that particular time. But uh, 300 engineers, uh, those will be, uh, those are high, high paying jobs. Uh, I think uh, we have 300 out there now. Now we're going to have 600 engineers. So just wanted to announce that. Uh, again, uh, I, I hate it for Erlanger, but I certainly uh, appreciate 300 of them coming to Georgetown because it's going to be a big boost to our economy. Okay, city attorney, city clerk, second reading of city clerk <coughs> treasurer's job description ordinance, sponsored by Ms. Tackett. <clears throat> Whereas KRS 83A.085, subsection 3, subsection E, allows the city to establish additional duties of the city clerk beyond those duties already established in statute. Whereas the city of Georgetown desires to set forth those duties of the city clerk treasurer. Now, therefore, be it ordained by the city of Georgetown. Section 1. Code of Ordinances, Article 3, Division 4, Section 2-78, titled Duties, is hereby amended as follows. In addition to the duties required by KRS 83A, Point zero eight five and such other duties as assigned by statute and ordinance, the clerk, treasurer, or his or her designee shall perform the following duties. A. Attend each council meeting, regular and special. B. Record council proceedings and keep minutes. C. Publish all legal advertisements, budget summaries, or text and all ordinances adopted by council. D. Collect city ad valorem taxes, including delinquent taxes. Process and print yearly ad valorem tax statements. F. Make deposits and distribute receipts when required. G. Perform the duties of the Alcohol Beverage Control Administrator, including but not limited to A. 
collecting regulatory and license fees, B, issuing local alcoholic beverage licenses, C, conducting hearings and issuing orders regarding violations of state and local ABC laws. H, act as custodian of records receiving, processing, and responding to all open records requests. I, collect city insurance premium tax, including delinquent taxes. J, collect garbage, utility, and railroad franchise fees. K, collect code enforcement fines. L, report sales and use tax to the Commonwealth of Kentucky. M, coordinate advertisements and bids openings for all competitive procurements. N, administer the annual surplus property sale and other surplus sales as necessary. O, license all fleet vehicles. P, issue park permits for permitted streets uh, like Dudley and Clayton. Issue golf cart permits. R, coordinate special events assisting citizens in obtaining city permissions for 5Ks, parades, etc. S, serve as non-member secretary for the Board of Ethics. T, coordinate bi-monthly meetings with all city directors for council meeting preparation. U, prepare the agenda for council meetings after consultation with the mayor, city staff, and council meetings as necessary. V, ensure many meeting, open meetings law compliance for council and committee meetings. W, prepare an annual budget for the clerk's office. X, administer financial interest disclosure requirement for all city directors, board members, elected officers and candidates for elected office. Y, provide information to the public in persons and by phone. Z, greet visitors and perform other office duties when necessary. Section two, the ordinance shall take place upon passage and publication. Publicly introduced and read for the first time, April 14th, 2014. Publicly read the second time and passed, April 28th, 2014. Motion, Motion. for approval. Motion. Motion. Second. Second. Any discussion? Question. Yes, sir. Andrew, on uh, under G, where it says perform the duties of the alcohol beverage control administrator, including but not limited to, down there on C on that part is conducting hearings and issuing orders regarding violations of state and local ABC laws. Is the clerk going to be trained as a hearing officer? Is there going to be training involved? Normally, the clerk would hire someone to serve as the investigator. It the clerk is by law the person who conducts the hearing just like at the state mm -hmm. it would be the uh, the director but the director will always hire someone to serve as a hearing officer and that would be the process that I would recommend in any hearing that the uh, that the ABC officer conducts is there a here is there a hearing uh, procedure that we're going to follow on this yeah, I would recommend that you follow 13B. Now, that's not actually it is it's set in forth ordinance. in our ordinance that we follow 13B. Oh, okay. So yes. Not in that one, but in the yeah. ordinance. Okay. All right. Okay. Anything else? Second reading. Roll call vote, please. Mr. Lesby. Yes. Mr. McEwen. Yes. Mr. Penn. Yes. Mr. Showalter. Yes. Mr. Singer? Yes. Mrs. Tackett? Yes. Mr. Thompson? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Next item, technology, municipal order, approving quote for computers. An order approving an increase to the Parks Department for purchase of computers, whereas the Georgetown Scott County Parks Department needs to purchase eight computers to replace existing unsupported PCs. Now, therefore, it is hereby ordered by the Georgetown City Council that $2,528.32 is transferred to the account for parks and recreation to fund one half the cost of the purchase of replacement computers. I got that account number upstairs. I, I apologize. I forgot wow. to fill in the I blank. Stacy can fill it. <laughs> right off. The other half being, I'm uh, sorry, I didn't ask this ahead of time, on the county. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. Motion. Okay. Any, anything? Motion for approval? Yes. Second, Connie. Okay. Any, any discussion? This has to do with the issue of um, Windows XP not being supported. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also, uh, this problem was uh, giving sophisticity problems as far as updating computers and making them more more usable basically so that's the reason and they're old and they're old, okay. and they're old. that would be the main reason primary do, do we need a budget amendment for this as well yes we had a motion did you get a motion look at the finger yeah i got a, a motion and a second mm -hmm. okay we so do we're discussing any any other comments yeah according to our 
our, our budget up. ordinance. Oh, Got to have you recorded. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just stay up here next anyway. Uh, now, according to our budget ordinance, it's only if it's a transfer between funds or you're bringing new revenue that you have to actually have the two readings of a budget amendment ordinance. So as far as um, bringing in new money into a department, it just has to have council approval, but it doesn't have to be in that budget amendment ordinance. So by approving this municipal order, you're approving bringing that 2500 into the parks and rec line. <coughs> it doesn't have to be in that. And it'll be coming from the general government? It'll be coming from the current excess revenues we have right now. Okay. If it's, it's, revenues it's, yeah. exceeding expenses right now, so it'll just it'll come from that. It fits within that Parks and Rec budget. The level of control we've, we've, we've asked to have over the budget, we have over, I mean, the Parks and Rec budget, there's still money left in it. It fits within it. Is that correct? We haven't gone over the line. And, and we haven't gone over that line item. Of course, we give them on a monthly basis their portion. So okay. my understanding is this will be, this was something that was not included in this year's budget, so this would be an additional okay. allocation to them. Was how it was, how it was presented to me. And I right. So as long as we have an overage in our general government, we don't have to do a budget amendment to increase the budgets of, of any department or the local departments or? This doesn't increase it. Right, it, it, right, as long as you're not transferring between funds and you're not bringing in revenues. And we've done a couple of things via budget amendment because we had new <coughs> revenues or something in other areas, so I just threw, put it all together. But no, you do not. If there's a budget ordinance that, um, gosh, from 2005 that sets out what we actually have to do the formal ordinance process for. And it's only uh, bringing in new revenue and transfers between departments. Just Any other comments? <laughs> All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you, Steve. Okay, while you're up there, your quarterly finance update. Just want to make a quick brief. Uh, obviously, I also gave you your March 31st uh, revenues and expenditures. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that one. That's your normal monthly report that I give you. But just to say we are 75% um, through the year, but keep in mind that um, a lot of times the collections for March are actually for the month of February, so on a couple of your revenue items, uh, occupational license fee, the payroll tax, even though it only shows 67% collected, that's because it's through the month of February. Uh, because the March collections are for the month of February, and it, as well on the insurance license fees. Uh, because it's showing 64% collected, but that is actually only the first two quarters of the year because the quarter ended March 31st. Those collections come in April. Therefore, they're not reflected on this report. So currently, we're showing um, that we have collected 71% of our revenue budgets, but like I said, keeping in mind a couple of those larger line items really are only showing the first two quarters or through February. So those will go up. Our total expenditures uh, for the general fund are showing at 72.7%. So tracking in line uh, with that. So I just wanted to touch on those two items briefly. But what I really wanted to focus on was our quarterly revenue analysis that I present to you. Uh, starting with our payroll tax collections, uh, we had a budget of $10.4 million. Uh, we currently have collected 67% of our budget through the month, like I said, of February. Uh, those always run a month behind. And we're about 5% ahead of where we were at this point in the year, last year. At this point in the year last year, we had collected 62% of our total. This year, we've collected 67% of our projected. So um, there's another, another analysis that was shared with me, I think, that uh, Revenue Commission did, and they're showing the same. We're trending about 5 to 6% ahead. So when I present the budget to you, uh, the first meeting in May, you'll, you'll see some of those increases coming into play into what we're projecting for next year. Uh, the net profit um, tax collections we budgeted. Um, as you know, we've updated this budget a couple times throughout the year for some additional receipts that have come in. So our, our last budget was two million one hundred eighteen thousand two hundred. We currently have collected two million one hundred sixty eight thousand three sixty nine. Uh, so we have received a few uh, estimates obviously our largest manufacturer and that is why that budget has uh, trended ahead 
um, even taking that out. So look, even if we take out the net profits estimates from our largest manufacturer, we are still trending um, about 55% ahead of last year. So at this time last year, we had collected 456,000. Um, taking out Toyota, we have already collected 710,000 this year. So still trending well ahead with our other um, employers and businesses. Insurance premium tax collections, again, as I mentioned, uh, showing the analysis through, these are actually the first two quarters, so really these are only showing through December 31st. The quarter ending March 31st would have come in this month, and you'll see that on your next update. And we're currently trending about 335000 or 17% ahead of where we were this time last year. Uh, we budgeted $2 million and we've currently collected $1,291,557. So um, we seem to be seeing some new business uh, coming in in that arena. Property taxes, obviously, um, we continue to collect a little bit there. Uh, even at this point in the year, we budgeted $1.4 million and have collected $1,503,000. $104, so we collected 107% of that budget. Um, typically trending uh, the last few years, we see a, a decent month in April, I guess right before you turn them over. Uh, so we may see another fairly strong collection month, and then of course it drops off. Finally, alcohol. Um, again, this has updated uh, through December 31st, like the insurance premium taxes, those um, returns are due this month. I updated it through the numbers as of this morning, and we currently had in 94661 for the current quarter, but pretty much our biggest seller has not yet reported. So uh, based on what they've brought in, I would think a minimum of 175 for this quarter, and then there were obviously some other smaller uh, retailers that had not yet reported. So we're currently 68% of that budget, and uh, current budget is 695000 and uh, we'll see how these last couple quarters come in. I expect to bring in a little more than that probably next year, and you'll see that in the budget projection. So, any questions on either of these reports? We are recovering. That's the good news. We're doing good, and uh, like I said that should help play into our budget address and budget pro projections for the next. Everything is moving in the direction it needs to be moving in. That's for sure. That's wonderful news. Thanks, Stacy. Georgetown Water approval of the bid from N.E. Zabcar for the replacement of the sludge conveyor auger system at wastewater treatment plant one. I guess I got all that out, yeah, Rob. You, Mayor. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> um, this, this is a line item in our fiscal 2014 budget. It's approved by our board on April 15th. They were the low bidder on this project. Questions to council approval of this uh, project? Motion. Motion. Second. Any, any questions of Mr. Wilhite this time? All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you, sir. Human Resources, Megan, explain what we're doing here. <laughs> I have a municipal order before you tonight that would amend and recodify the drug-free workplace policy. Um, in conjunction with the Kentucky Department for Workers Claims as part of the Department of Labor and KLC, um, I have learned that in our efforts to potentially become a zero-tolerance drug-free workplace, we would be following along the paths of most people who are certified drug-free workplace participants. Um, what this policy would actually do for us is solidify what we're actually already doing. The current policy says that at the discretion of the mayor or the mayor's designee, we can determine when there is a positive drug or alcohol test exactly what we will do. And that can range from immediate termination all the way down to sending that person for rehabilitation. Um, the way the mayor and I have worked together to interpret the policy since, since, at least since I've been here, has been an immediate termination on a positive drug screen or alcohol screen. Um, this policy would um, written as the way it's presented to you, just present a more um, clear policy to potential employees, current employees, as to what will happen if they test positive for drugs or alcohol. Now, in compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act, 
if any of our employees ever come to us prior to testing positive and say that they need some sort of rehabilitation or help, there are, um, there's wording in the policy to speak for how we will help them with that, and we certainly will. Um, even if someone tests positive and we do go to an immediate termination because of a zero tolerance policy, um, there, we will still, of course, offer them um, the uh, employee assistance program and anything we can to help them rehabilitate. However, um, their position will not be waiting for them at the end of that. Um, it just speaks very strongly to say, obviously, we are zero tolerance. We will not let you be protecting our citizens or operating our equipment under the influence. If you ever do that, we will terminate immediately. As she said, this is something that I've been practicing since I've been here. Uh, we'll not have employees out operating our equipment and putting the city at great liability, which is exactly what they will be doing. And all of our employees will uh, we'll have a meeting to notify them of the policy change. Again, it's not really a change. It's just putting into words that, that they'll be able to see. And certainly all new employees will be uh, told of, of this policy. So uh, again, I think it's a, certainly a step in the right direction. And uh, we're here to help our employees whenever we can when, when we know in advance that they have a problem. But if uh, if we test them and they test positive, then they're gone. Is, I mean, the, so. uh, is the policy right now at the mayor's discretion or at your discretion? How is it? How does it work now? It's it's both. Um, exactly the way it states it. Let me get that for you. Well, I have the final say on all. Final you know. Say. Yeah. Final say. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. I mean, okay. I, I work for the mayor, but it talks about the mayor's designee. It means the city employee or the official designated by the mayor. To administer and enforce this policy and to carry out the functions, duties, and responsibilities otherwise identified in this policy as belonging to the mayor's designation. I guess my I guess my one problem I have with this is that I don't want as a council to do anything to take away the mayor's discretion in terms of dealing with this. Obviously, right. if we have the situation where someone is on the job intoxicated in some manner, driving a police cruiser heavy equipment, whatever, I would hope under his discretion that that person would be terminated. Mm -hmm. At the same time, there are hypothetical cases where you know, someone who's addicted or uh, intoxicated uh, might show up for work and while it's a serious problem and obvious disciplinary steps and steps toward trying to get that person into treatment need to be taken. It, I think it goes a bit far for for immediate termination and to put that put that sort of thing into writing. I mean, I I trust the mayor's discretion, trust his judgment in trying to decide how to deal with this. I don't want to do anything to take that power away from this particular executive branch or any future executive branches. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing is, I mean, zero tolerance policy is just is just a way to, I, I, I don't, I, when you look at um, addiction, I think when you look at a zero tolerance policy, you're looking at it in terms of just it being a purely more case of morality or personal choice, whereas alcoholism, drug addiction is also a medical condition. And a lot of times the only way that this stuff is disclosed is through a positive drug test or through well they're free to come to us we, we will give them the help and it will not cost them their job if they come to us in advance before, but if they leave it to for us to find out before the yeah before the positive test i just am reluctant to try to treat something along those lines um, as something that's just a purely moral choice in terms of free will it, it isn't it's, it's a medical condition as well like I said, if there's a case where they're actually endangering the public or criminality, obviously that's at the discretion of the mayor, but I wouldn't want to cast a vote tonight, A, to take away the, the power of the executive branch to make that decision. Number two, I think zero tolerance policy says to the employees that we think this is uh, you know, purely a question of morality, not just of medical conditions. So I'll be voting against this. Okay. Any other comments? Well, I understand. I sponsor this, and I agree with it 100%. And while I understand it, that's exactly what Mark's talking about, 
on the flip side of that, people that do drugs and come to work, they're hiding it and they're not going to come and tell you unless they want help. They have to ask for help and a lot of times they have to hit rock bottom before they ever do that and in the meantime um, you're putting the city and other co-workers in jeopardy by them working and while I understand you want them to get help they have to go ask for that help and while they're working here it, it's not going to happen and I, I don't mean to sound catty or not sympathetic at all but it's just a reality that you know they they stoop to all kinds of things because to to get that drug so I absolutely 100 percent and honestly we did look at this as a measure to remove any subjectivity from the decision um, let's just say that the mayor's favorite employee is employee A and the mayor's least favorite employee is employee B and both of them test positive on one day and the mayor says I want A out here and I want B to stay I mean there's there's subjectivity in it right now and you know to remove the ability for anyone to say you know what I decide that you get to rehab but you don't um, it, it's taken out of there yeah, well, it's, it's tough. Mm -hmm. It is tough. It's, it's I, hard. It's extremely. I can understand <laughs> an argument. The only point I would make is that uh, drug laws and the policy itself, and then the various statutes, both federal and state, regarding drug drug laws, are so labyrinthine and so esoteric as to be as, as to say to somebody that you violate any part of that, and we find out about it, and we're going to fire you based upon a zero tolerance policy. It's in itself arbitrary because. There are many times when people violate those laws and nobody knows about it. I mean, for example, something as small as, say, um, taking, uh, you know, your prednisone, you know, something you could take for mononucleosis or something along those lines, taking it out of the original bottle and putting it in a baggie to take to work or, or make it more portable is actually a violation of the law. Mm -hmm. And un according to this policy, if that's found out and prosecuted in some way, that person is fired immediately. For something like taking, a, you know, prescription <laughs> prescription strength of leave and putting it in a certain new container. It's illegal to take your prescription. It is illegal to have a prescription. Yeah. Prescription. Huh? Not, in the original. Well, not in the original container. Mm -hmm. But something like yeah. that. Yeah, it's not something we probably have to pursue. It's a, mm -hmm. it's obviously and that's my point. I mean, there are a decision as far as whether or not to actively pursue something like that, or active or not to. Mm -hmm. And whether or not that decision is taken by a third party affects whether or not a person is going to be fired according to zero tolerance policy. I think that would be looked at a little bit different because they aren't coming in yeah. under the influence is okay. what this is all about. Under the influence and, and being allowed to operate in the equipment that we have. I'm sure if they bring prescription drug in and they're caught with that, it'd be reported to the police department. And that's the action we would take on that. But it's being under the influence and failing a drug test. I mean, I don't have a problem with how this is being yeah. dealt with now. If under your discretion, you're basically um, immediately terminating people right now, that's your decision as the executive branch. I just don't want to do anything to take away his well, discretion. My, my first concern, certainly it's for the employee, but my main concern is for the community. Right. And the at risk that we're putting our fellow employees and members of the, of the community. Any other comments? I think what we're doing here is creating a standardization on how we react in situations like that. And I think she made a good example there a minute ago with employee A, employee B. I think what we're doing is we're reinforcing that we are going to have a standard protocol on how we deal with that. It's not going to be subject to with all due respect, the, the mood of the mayor on Thursday morning versus the mood of the mayor on Friday afternoon. Um, so that's, I, I think I, I support this fully and I, I, think it's a, I think it's a great thing. Here again, it, it's simply putting into words plainly what sure. I've been enforcing Absolutely. all the time anyway. Uh, it, it, it's been at my discretion before, now it's, it's part of policy. I don't think it's taking anything away from you. No, anyway. it is no. not. You'll have the final say so on what you should right. do or could do or will do so right. sure even as his designee i don't have the authority to suspend or right any right it's all got to go before you right okay motion for approval motion mayor I second second by miss tackett 
All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? Mark opposed. No problem. No problem. Okay, planning and zoning, first reading of an ordinance, amending subdivision regulations for preliminary plats and plans, sponsored by Ms. Tackett. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council. Welcome, Joe. Thank you. Good to be here. Um, this, what, we, what you have for you today is a request, or a, actually uh, an action the Planning Commission took um, to uh, amend the subdivision development regulations to add a uh, expiration period for preliminary class of plans. And um, I'll go into it a little bit further to explain the process. But preliminary class preliminary development plans go through a public hearing process and are approved by the Planning Commission. After that, if they're active projects, they submit construction plans for, for class. Um, those are reviewed internally once approved. The infrastructure is put in. After the infrastructure is put in, um, inspected, approved, um, the bonding is put up, then they submit a final plan. So that's the process for, for preliminary, for major preliminary plans. For development plans, the public hearings at the preliminary development plan stage, then they uh, developer will submit construction plans. Once those are approved, they'll submit a final, final development plan that's approved then they go ahead and construct the project so this is um, a reaction to um, to address issues where projects are approved at the preliminary stage and then they go no further they either um, you know don't get funding they languish um, they don't go beyond the preliminary stage so this is to address um, <coughs> that by adding an expiration or a sunset clock to those, those projects. Um, it's going to help us plan to know what current projects are active, are going to be built. Uh, it will help address those issues where preliminaries approved, you know, for whether, whatever reason it doesn't go forward, but currently we don't have a sunset clause or an expiration for any preliminaries. So they're still available to be built at some point in the future and <coughs> development occurs around them. Say a new school is built adjacent, um, new subdivisions go in around them. Uh, maybe we want a road connection, we want, you know, other, um, there are no other issues that need to be looked at. So in those cases uh, where the projects don't move forward, the preliminary simply has to come back through the public hearing process and go back through the planning commission. Um, for planning commission approval. So you probably um, have some pre preliminaries over there, Joe, that <coughs> yeah, we have, have a little bit of age on them. Yeah, we actually have quite a few, uh, a lot out in the county, but a few <coughs> in the city as well. Joe, would, would those be grandfathered in or would they be impacted by this? This is looking forward, so this is, isn't retroactive, so those are grandfathered. Those wouldn't be affected by this, but with development picking up, we want to you know, be proactive. And just don't want to add to that number that we already right. have. We want to be able to, you know, um, plan moving forward and um, have a good grasp on what, what projects are active, what projects are permitted, and, um, you know, be you know, able to look at those as they move forward. Um, How many projects so do we have in that, in that condition right now? I don't have those numbers. I can get those numbers next time it's probably um, under a dozen okay. in the city <coughs> a little bit over a dozen in the county and they're worth Not a huge number but, but they're worth probably several hundred houses or several hundred single family dwell yeah I would say, so. okay. I would say probably um, probably around 500 in the city okay. yes. was there discussion about including them to be applicable with with what we're looking for or can we do that there we can't really do that without um, addressing um, the takings issue I mean we have to compensate uh, property owners for those okay. uh, mm -hmm. but we can moving forward we can't put that that uh, regulation in place to just require after a certain amount of time if the project doesn't move forward to come back to 
planning commission public hearing process. So right now the plats that are already platted, that's all you we already consider that to be a part of their property. I mean a, the expectation that's been built in based upon getting the plat approved and the zoning thereof is now considered they part have, of the part and yes, They have that preliminary approval um, up to that point. If we don't have a grandfathering clause in, mm -hmm. then they do have that uh, for right to develop the forever the preliminary. Basically for posterity forever? Yeah, forever. Unless we go back, we can, unless we go back and retroactively address those plots. I mean, I'm not, I mean, I think that's fair. I mean, I think it's, you know, I think the expectation was when they got that approved that that would be part of their, uh, part and parcel of their property. So I, I, that's the main thing I was concerned with is that uh, their property rights on that issue, at least the ones that have already been approved wouldn't be infringed upon. So that's fine. Joe, would this impact all zone classifications, whether it's residential, commercial, industrial, or was it specific? Um, all, all classes. And they're all going to be impacted. Yeah. Kind of explain that again, then. It's the preliminary development plan, right? That's the one that's being impacted, not the final development plan. Right. The preliminary development plan or the preliminary plat. In the case of a preliminary development plan, once you uh, go through the public hearing process, typically you go straight to final development plan and submit construction plans for the site mm -hmm. and a final development plan and get that approved right away. If you don't do that within, we have a two-year expiration period on these. If, if you don't do that within two years, typically that project's not, not going to happen. Was there much discussion about whether it should be one year, two years, three years, four years, or five years? Yes. Or? Yes. We went back and forth on the length of time we should, we should give. We also looked at other communities in the bluegrass area. Typically, there's a one-year um, period. Um, since we've never had that sunset clause, we wanted to give a little bit more time. If it turns out implementing this, that we can, you know, we can scale it back, or we can give more time, then we can see how it goes. But it was decided that two years is a comfortable period that. Um, developer knows that that's the case, that there's this two-year window where they need to move forward on the project or they have to adapt the plan. That would be a comfortable period. We did look at other communities and 10 out of 13 communities in the Bluegrass area do have sunset clauses and typically they're one year. Preliminary is good for one year if you don't uh, move forward. From that point, you either have to go back to the Planning Commission to go through the process again, um, or you can ask, typically you can ask for an extension of the year, which we've added in our next uh, opportunity to ask for an extension. Right, so it's two years plus an extension. Two years plus the extension. What are the qualifiers for the extension? Um, if there are no changes, appreciable changes in the surrounding area, then it's essentially an automatic extension. Uh, if we look at it, there have been changes, you know, development around or adjacent, increases in major increases in traffic that have, uh, affect the local service of the road serving the development, uh, then we can um, not grant the extension if we list out those reasons in writing, by writing uh, a written um, reasoning of our denial of the extension. If, if there was a zone change associated with the development, is that still exempt from any Yes, that any would be reconsideration? Exempt. The zone change would stay in place, so the zoning would revert to the previous zone. Is that is that consistent with what other counties do surrounding yeah. us? Mm -hmm. Okay. So once the zone change is, is set, it's pretty much set. It's set, although it's possible that you can allow for revisionary zoning with the public hearing. I mean, that's, that's allowable. But, but the zone change has to do with the general environment in the area. It doesn't necessarily tie it into the particular development that's being proposed. The zone change is what a statement by planning and zoning or by the council or fiscal court one that this particular area 
it's changed from say A1 into sort of a B2 zoning. And it isn't, that decision isn't necessarily tied with the development plan, even if, even if the zoning has been proposed by the developer or by the property owner, that decision isn't necessarily tied into the development itself. Is that right? Um, surrounding zoning it isn't tied directly to an adjacent parcel. If you're talking about rezoning of a specific piece of property, mm -hmm. it increases the development, typically increases the developable pool. Yeah, yeah, know. yeah. Um, but I, I guess my question is, is that in terms of like a legal question or question of fact before the zoning board and before you, when you change the zoning, even if, a, even if say a piece of A1 property and it's asked to be rezoned to let's say R2, um, the question of whether or not that should be changed to R2 is, is independent of the fact independent of any proposed development on that property yeah it's independent of this, this so something. you don't think about you don't think about the proposal or what what the plans like you, you think about well that a1 property is surrounded by other housing developments or you know there's a road there's adequate there's adequate drainage adequate you know water and sewer road whatever that question's answered in the positive for that to be R2 or R1 or whatever, then you look at the question of the, of the development. Is that right? Right. I pretty much, I got Yeah, that's right. right. I mean, when you get to the preliminary plan or plan stage, you're looking at the specifics of the development. So the, no, so the, the reason that it wouldn't be revised after the period of two years is that the question of zoning is independent of the preliminary plat, the, the development plan is shown in the preliminary plat. Is that right? Yeah, for the most part, yeah. Okay. But now that's not exactly what we instructed someone to do a few weeks ago. Didn't we have someone in here petitioning for a zone change and we asked for a, for a preliminary drawing? They were asking for an is it annexation? Mm -hmm. yes, but we sent them annexation. back to do a preliminary okay. drawing before we right. granted annexation. Yeah. Right. Okay. Joe, this is something that the Planning Commission recommends? Yes. This is something that, that we'll... talked about for a long time, and they held a public hearing in March, and they... Okay, and this is something that will help your workload there in the office? Yeah, not... <laughs> that sounds like a little extra. <laughs> help us uh, to properly plan for future growth. And the developer is given more than ample time to proceed with the plans. Yes. What this is going to do for us, it's not going to have all of those hostile hundreds and hundreds of homes on a, on a plot. That, mm -hmm. You know, in two years, you might have one that's going to have 200 homes, but they don't go ahead and start. That's coming off, so you're reducing that amount of homes or whatever that you could build in the future. So, is that correct? Right. When, when you when you get to the well, extension were, phase, well, like a possible right. two year, if they don't start within two years, then well, after the preliminary, you know, plat, and you get that two years, and they go two years without getting the final approval or, or doing any work on it. When you come to the question of the extension, are you going to base that look back at the staff report in which the preliminary plan was approved, and here are the reasons why, and are the reasons going to be? Um, explicit enough and inclusive enough to where in two years time you can look and say okay well this has changed this situation for example a new road's gone through and in the reasons why we approve the preliminary plat we specifically mention the size of the road the state of the road I mean I guess the, the main point I would make and it's not really a question so much as a point is that you have to be really clear on the reasons you're approving the plat in the first place so that in two years time you'll turn around and say okay well we did it based on these reasons and those reasons have now changed in two years time to make it really a meaningful decision I mean I think that's the main the main, the main problem I would have well, um, property once it's zoned is permitted for a certain type of density of development mm -hmm. so the plat really when we look at the plat as long as it meets our subdivision regulations or our development regulations um, we look at the surrounding area infrastructure 
um, whether there's sewer water availability, whether there's any um, stormwater issues, whether the roads are adequate, when we approve a plat, but we don't we, we don't deny it if it meets all our regulations mm -hmm. because it's zoned for it's zoned for development if it's being developed. So go again as far as how you see an extension being denied. Well, an extension could be denied if there's appreciable changes in the in the surrounding area. Say there's there's been development adjacent, there's been an increase in traffic on the road serving the development, then it could be denied based on the appreciable changes in the area that would be that would call for it to be reheard by the planning commission and re um, a new analysis of the development, but not necessarily to deny it, but to add any conditions potentially that are needed to address the right. changes in, in conditions. And the conditions would so, be and the conditions would be listed in the staff report at the time the preliminary plan was approved, wouldn't it? Yes, and, and it would be listed in our letter of denial of the potentially a letter of denial of the continuance. Yeah, the, yeah, the same conditions that you thought about two years before. We'd be addressing the changes. Changes, yeah, the changes in the condition. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I think I understand. Motion for approval. Yeah. Oh, that's first reading. First reading. Yeah, first reading. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll have you lost me there. <laughs> I was getting ready to motion. <laughs> first reading of an ordinance. First reading. An ordinance amending the Georgetown Scott County Subdivision and Development Regulations. Summary. Section 1. Amends Article 3 of the Georgetown Scott County Subdivision and Development Regulations to provide that preliminary plat approvals are val valid for a period of two years. Provides that where street or utility improvements are involved, approval of construction plans for a proposed subdivision or phase of a subdivision shall extend the preliminary plat approval an additional two years from the date of the construction plan approval provides that where street or utility improvements are not involved approval of final plat for a proposed subdivision or phase of a subdivision shall extend the preliminary plat approval an additional two years from the date of final plat approval provides for an additional one-year extension of preliminary subdivision plat approvals provided that appreciable changes in the vicinity of the approved preliminary plat has not occurred upon application to the director of the planning commission and subject to the commission's review section 2 amends article 4 of the georgetown scott county subdivision and development regulations to provide that preliminary development plan approvals are valid for a period of two years provides for an additional one-year extension of preliminary development plan approvals provided that appreciable changes in the vicinity of the approved preliminary development plan have not occurred upon application to the director of the planning commission and subject to the commission's review section three provides that all prior ordinances and parts of ordinances in conflict with this ordinance are repealed section four provides that this ordinance shall become effective on passage and publication Okay, thank you. First reading. Thank you, Joe. Police Department. Captain? Mayor, Council, Chief Fosse can't be here tonight. Instead, Police Department continues to do some great work in the community. We've had uh, a couple of officers that were uh, involved in solving a uh, pretty significant residential burglary this last week. And uh, we've got two officers that are also going to put in for a uh, life saving award for uh, their efforts in saving a uh, life earlier last week. We'll be presenting those at our department uh, picnic, which is uh, scheduled for later in May. Thank you, sir. Council, we need to go into closed session. Mayor, uh, make a motion to enter executive session, discuss uh, future sale or acquisition of real property pursuant to KRS 61.8101B. Second. Second. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? Okay.
Yeah. We have Turn to have a motion. Motion to come back. back. Wait there just a minute. Another second. There you go. Oh. Okay. Yeah. You got the... Uh, I got it. All in favor, aye? Aye. Aye. Okay. We're back in regular session. Council comments? I do have one thing I want to mention to you while I was out the other day over on um, Payne Street where the old um, fences, are knocked down. fences are knocked down and stuff. That needs to be looked at. That's it's right. Really I, I went bad. by there. I've got to tell Public Works. I had a, I had a complaint on that too. Yes. Yeah, they're laying down and so they're, the they've been damaged. Right. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Just wanted to bring that up to you. Is there anything that. we can do with that property now that it was brought up? I mean, yeah, whatever we can do with that digging. That dig well, you know, down there, up and down my street, uh, a couple summers ago, it was it was an amazing, uh, it was one of the amazing projects that ever happened in Georgetown that everybody knew about. Is they went down to that old railroad property where Havermeyer Oil used to be the Indian oil refinery right on the creek and at the end of North Hamilton. North Hamilton. They took uh, 18 wheelers after 18 wheeler full of you know dump beds of dirt from out of there, and I, and I suppose it was a federal project. It turned out. I, out that it was you know there might be a possibility of doing something along those lines at the um, at that property at the old briar hill property to find out you know be great the, be great i mean it's just a it's a huge I mean, piece of property it, I, just I sitting went, there I, I mean it was amazing the amount of dirt they took out and i think they took it up to ohio believe it or not um out of that property to remediate it and uh, if they're willing to do that old property uh, at the... Is there the a federal I grant, I'm assuming? I think there Brownfield was, yeah. Type. yeah, Brownfield, but... That's you could always apply yeah. for one, yeah, see what they'll... Apply for it and look into it. Is that like, get an EPA approved like we yeah. did over there uh, on Bourbon Street? Mm -hmm. uh, that that yeah. neighborhood, which is you know, my neighborhood for we'll disclosure. We'll you know, we'll you know if we could look. do something like that to maybe even eventually get a park in there. Yeah. 10, 15 years from now. Because it's a great little... It's on Bluff, actually, and you can look back... Down below all the way down to yeah, all the way down, down, down to Fisters. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's pretty amazing. We could call it Singer's Garden. Oh. <laughs> 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 uh, Woo! Okay, motion to adjourn. Second. <laughs> Anything else? <laughs> Kelly, I, I had a question about the the alley off Kelly Avenue that runs uh, <laughs> parallel with with West Main um, towards um, the Quill old run. the old loop. Yeah. Towards Quail Run or towards the old hospital property, about what? Oh, okay. I mean, that's still, uh, I think, designated as a city street because it's an alley. So I, I don't I know talked if there's to, any, uh, has there been any concern or expressed at, yeah, there has. at City Hall? Okay. <laughs> I talked to uh, one of the owners <clears throat> who's on Main Street, whose only method of access is that alley. Okay. Um, she's an attorney, she works with guests Mattingly, and we probably talked for an hour. Um, she says that. The, there's quite a bit of history on that property going back. Apparently the original records were destroyed in a flood or a fire or something, but it is on record as a city street. Apparently the new, move, the new neighbors who've moved in on the corner right. have, have started a sort of an informal petition to have that street closed. So even they appear to recognize it as a city street. Um, so I explained to her the process and the statute for Closing a city street, they call it closing. That's not really what you're doing. You're you're abandoning it back to private. Mm -hmm. But all of the surrounding uh, uh, adjoining property owners have to agree, or um, the city council can do it as an adverse action. But they're subject essentially to being sued and to paying fair market value for the loss to the <coughs> adjoining property owners. So I said uh, I honestly didn't see unless there was unanimity among those landowners of the city taking such an adverse action. Um, so that said, <laughs> if that's a public street, we probably ought to think about maintaining it as mm -hmm. such. <laughs> um, now I'm told by this attorney that some years ago, 10 to 15 years ago, that we went and constructed a retaining wall. Apparently a lot of that gravel was washing out into um, an adjacent property owner's yard, so they put up a retaining wall. Um, we don't know what kind of uh, maintenance has been done to it since. So do we have a, so there's an actual flat or map that says that there's a city street there. Mm, I think he's saying there's no record. 
Well, the way she described it, I, I'll be honest, I'm not 100% clear on it. She says that there is an easement of record. It, it predates Platts. There's an easement of record to the city. Mm. Okay. This was like back in the 40s and 50s before the concept of a filed plat, I think, was even... Are you talking about where St. Luke's is? Or are you talking about no, Kelly no, Avenue you, that you go you in go and go Kelly, to the quail? Going to the left quail. before quail. Going to oh. the left before quail. Going to the right. You okay. won't even know. It's right behind the... the really? Don't you know don't even realize that... You don't know. It's, it would be an alley. Hmm. Or, but for the... It's not there. Right there to the left before you go into quail. Is that what you're saying beside that house? Yes. Okay, gotcha. Right behind Go take a look. Never paid attention to that. Go take a look at it. I don't... I can't... I can't visually see it now. I didn't know. He's, he knows more about it. Yeah, take, we'll take a look at what's filed in our office. Mm. But, well, it's not. We don't own it. See, we don't, we're not owners. It's just a public right of way. Well, would like it have been street. anywhere on any of the plats or development when they developed the Shea Estate? I don't know. All I know so is that this. this to start. I haven't looked, but this okay. attorney, uh, who in her own interest said she came to the courthouse and did several hours worth of research. And so that is what she determined. I could I could talk to her again, but and is this the sole access to her house? Yes. Mm -hmm. There is no street there is no street driveway. There's no on street parking on Main Street there. So obviously that's <laughs> oh, okay. the only place she goes Comes up Kelly, takes side. a left down mm -hmm. that oh, yeah. now the, the other property owner she says has offered her an easement as she would have to do. Common law would say that she could finish. not deny her the oh, right to access finish. her own property, but um Oh, okay. I think I know what you're talking about. All right. I think that it is, a, according to her, it is, it, it is her preference to have it remain a public way rather than a private way with a right of access. If I'm sitting in her shoes, I'm arguing the same thing. But you know, yeah, we don't so want it's to about what's, her access. It's about what's right for the public. When, as far as the city maintaining a street, it's it's not about an individual owner. It's about the the public. So, so we're dealing. So we're dealing with a street that's not on a map. So oh, it's on a map. It's on a map. It's on a map. Oh, it's on a map. <laughs> not, it's not on a... It's not, Google, it's not on Google Maps, but it's on maps. Right. Well, it's on, <laughs> if there's a city map of streets, I think it's on yeah. that. It's on that. Yeah. You said it's not on a plat. City city maps, maps of streets. Yeah, it's on there's no right name? Down. Does it have a name? Uh -huh. What's the name? The name is... Bradley Alley. Br Bradley Alley. Yeah, Thank that's you. All, I get that only from that segment. Right. Um, and there's a Bradley Alley that goes the other way, too. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. where I get yeah. the name. It's just yeah. an extension of Bradley Alley. Does it run... Both sides of According to the map, does it run yeah, and like connect to St. Right Luke Place? It does. Oh, okay. It does. All right. Well, All right. We'll check it out. Anything else, Council? I think it's fascinating. <laughs> there must be a ball game on tonight. Let's <laughs> see. I think he's hungry. Motion for adjournment. Let's roll. Motion. Six. All in favor, aye. Aye. Thank you. Very good. Good meeting.